Okay, so this is a tutorial on the humerus. So the humerus is this bone here, which runs from the shoulder down to the elbow, and it articulates with this scapula here. So this is the shoulder joint, the acromio, the glenohumeral joint. So, um, so there's several parts of the humerus that are important to know. So the bit that articulates with the scapula is known as the head. So it's this bit here. So I'll just isolate the humerus so you can have a look at that. So you can see the humeral head here, which articulates with the glenoid cavity in the scapula. So we're just rotating it around posteriorly. So the head is this small bit here. Just next to the head you've got a tubercle here, known as the lesser tubercle. So this is a slight bump which protrudes outwards. And then you've got the greater tubercle here. So just to put you back in, orientate you again. So the medial surface of the humerus articulates with the glenoid cavity. Then you've got the lesser tubercle and the greater tubercle. In between the greater and lesser tubercles, you've got this groove, which is called the intertubercular sulcus, or the bicipital groove. So separating the humeral head from the tubercles is the um, anatomical neck. So this is the anatomical neck of the humerus. This sort of imagine this line I'm drawing here. So it runs round like this. That's known as the anatomical neck. The surgical neck is a bit lower down, just inferior to the tubercles, so the surgical neck runs around just below the tubercles. So the surgical neck is called the surgical neck because most often fractures occur at this site. Very rarely do fractures occur at the anatomical neck. So surgeons are often operating and got that name because of the frequency of fractures. So the head faces medially, you've got the lesser tubercle and then the greater tubercle with the bicipital groove or the intertubercular sulcus running between the two tubercles. And you've got the surgical neck and the anatomical neck. So a few muscles, um, the, the bicipital groove, the inter intertubercular groove is important because you've got the um, tendon of the long head of the biceps which runs up through here. So if I just show you on the other side, you can see how it, the tendon runs up. So this is the tendon of the long head of the biceps running up through the intertubercular groove, and then it inserts onto the supraglenoid tubercle on the scapula. So the the bicipital groove also is a site of attachment for three muscles. So you've got the pectoralis major, which inserts on the lateral lip of the bicipital groove. The floor of the bicipital groove is the site of attachment for the latissimus dorsi. And the medial lip is where the teres major muscle attaches. So a way of remembering that is um, the mnemonic, the lady between two majors. So lady... L, latissimus dorsi, lies between the two majors, so pectoralis major and the teres major. So the latissimus dorsi runs in the floor of the intertubercular sulcus between the pectoralis major and the um, teres major. So the pectoralis major is this big muscle here, the latissimus dorsi is the big muscle of the back, and the teres major attaches to the um, lateral border of the scapula. So that's a little bit about the intertubercular sulcus. So just a little bit inferior and lateral to the um, intertubercular sulcus, you've got a tuberosity on the side of the humerus, which isn't really shown very well here, but there is a tuberosity here where the deltoid muscle attaches, so it's known as the deltoid tuberosity.
so you can see here where the deltoid muscle inserts laterally on the humerus just a little bit lateral and inferior to the intertubercular sulcus on the side here so that's known as the deltoid tuberosity where that inserts so the the length of this bone is known as the shaft um, which is not too complicated and then distally there are a few things that you need to know so you've got these epicondyles here, you've got a medial epicondyle and a lateral epicondyle and the medial epicondyle is important because the posterior surface of the medial epicondyle is where the ulnar nerve runs so the ulnar nerve sort of winds around the medial epicondyle and you can actually palpate it here so the medial epicondyle is quite an obvious bone in yourself, you can feel it quite easily and also at the distal end you've got the articulation with the radius bone and the ulna bone so it's not actually shown very clearly on here but you've got a condyle which consists of a capitulum and um, the trochlea which I'll show you on another diagram so I've just switched over to one of these diagrams and we're looking at the same view so anteriorly at the left humerus so you've got the head up here medially and you've got the medial epicondyle down here and the lateral epicondyle and this is the condyle I was talking about which is the art, um, articular part of the humerus so the capitulum which lies laterally articulates with the radial head and the trochlea which sits medially articulates with the ulna so this is the articular part of the humerus bone also worth pointing out just superior to the epicondyles you've got these ridges so you've got a lateral and medial supracondylar ridge so or epicondylar ridge so here you've got the, the, sup, um, the medial supracondylar ridge and here you've got the lateral supracondylar ridge and then there's three fossa that you need to know about in the distal humerus so you've got a coronoid fossa which lies superior to the trochlea so it's a little hollowing just above the trochlea and you've got this radial fossa which lies superior to the capitulum so I've just flicked back to the um, 3D model and then there's another fossa that you've got at the back known as the olecranon fossa so this part of the ulna bone is known as the olecranon so the fossa so you can just see it, this little indentation on the distal part of the posterior humerus so this is the olecranon fossa so you've got three fossa you've got the radial fossa which lies just above the capitulum you've got the coronoid fossa which lies just above the um, trochlea and you've got the olecranon fossa which lies at the back of the humerus so fractures that you get above the humor, uh, above the condyle are called supracondylar fractures and they're quite common in children so when when a child falls on their outstretched hand you get it's quite common to get a fracture a supracondylar fracture so a fracture around this level here above the condyle and what most commonly happens is that the um, distal fragment displaces backwards so it will fracture here and this portion the distal fragment will slip backwards and the proximal humerus this proximal fragment will slip forward and this is important to know because the brachial artery runs anterior to this bone so you can see I've just put in the brachial artery here and you can see its course in front of the humerus so you can see that if the fracture occurs here and the proximal fragment slips forward it's in danger of um, injuring the brachial artery so it's always important obviously to check neurovascular status of a patient who's had a supracondylar fracture so check the radial pulse so that's um, the humerus and I hope you've learnt something from that